joining today. Okay, let me restart. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Zoom today. Um, Women Animation welcomes guest artists and animator Kat Sai. Kat is a visual development artist who works at Sony Pictures Animation. She's currently working on Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and has worked on Steven Universe, um, Kipo, and the, uh, Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts and other animated films. Uh, Kat was titled um, Visible Woman on Twitter in 2019 and has thousands of fans worldwide who admire her artwork. Um, yeah, so Kat, you could totally take it away. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me here. I'm super excited to dive in today. Uh, I'm going to be starting off with just a little bit of a self-introduction, going through my art journey, how I got to where I am now, and then I'm going to be talking about what you can do to maybe help level up your art journey, uh, especially in terms of portfolio tips, social media, that kind of thing, anything to help get your foot in the door. And so I'm going to go ahead and take it away. Um, just as Ruchi was saying, my name is Kat. I've been working in the animation industry for about five years now. And currently, I am a VizDev artist on Spider-Verse 2, which is going to come out later this year. Um, I've loved to draw ever since I was a little kid. And pretty much this is kind of where it started. Uh, which is Virginia, where I'm from. I don't know if anyone else knows about or has been from Virginia, but it is basically, um, there, there's not that much to do there, to be honest. So when I was a little kid, you know, it wasn't really like living here in Los Angeles or in New York City, where you have restaurants and kind of fun things that you can do with pretty much just me at home uh, all the time. And as a result, all of my free time was kind of spent on uh, reading books. <laughs> and I was very obsessive about fantasy, sci-fi novels. I've read pretty much every young adult fiction series that was coming out in like the, the 2000s. Um, and as a result, I ended up spending a lot of time at Barnes and Noble. So if you guys have had similar experiences of this, you know what it's like to kind of like sit on the floor at a Barnes and Noble for like four hours until your mom like has to drag you out of there basically. And while I was spending tons of time at the bookstore, I came across a bunch of these how to draw manga books or how to draw fantasy books. And this was kind of my first introduction to digital art because up until that point, I had no idea that you could even draw with a computer. Like I just didn't know that was a thing. And after discovering these books specifically, it kind of opened my eyes to this whole other world of um, online artwork or digital drawing. And so this particular artist, her name is neon dragon and I ended up googling her and finding her deviantart page and then after you know finding this entire online art community I decided hey I think I want to try doing this too and posting my artwork online and so you know I got a mouse I got MS paint and I just started drawing uh, and at this point, you know, I was just having fun. I was really into dragons. So that was like 90% of my artwork was just dragon drawings. And I would draw with like a pencil and some printer paper and just scan it into my computer and then just start paint bucket tooling it in MS Paint. Um, and then as the years went on, my interests started shifting a little. So this was a, around when I was 13 or 14 years old. I started getting more into manga and anime and video games, that kind of thing. Um, and as a result, my artwork, the stuff that I was drawing also started changing as well, where it was definitely a little bit more fan art oriented. I really loved drawing characters, you know, at this point in time. Um, I got Photoshop. I got a bootleg copy of Photoshop, so I wasn't drawing on MS Paint anymore, which was much, much easier. 
Um, and then, yeah, uh, just throughout my high school years, you know, my interests kept changing. Um, now it was much more into uh, League of Legends. I was playing a lot of MMOs uh, with my friends and just kept going with posting on DeviantArt pretty much. I was still drawing at this time. You can definitely see how <laughs> the media that I was consuming was also having a big impact on the way that I was drawing as well. And after a few years, I was 17 years old and it was time for me to graduate from high school and go off to college. And to give some context that I hadn't really explained earlier, this entire time throughout high school, I was going to this really intense STEM high school in Virginia, where like 95% of the students there ended up working as, uh, you know, an engineer at Google or a neuroscientist. And I pretty much just did not fit in at all. I had a few friends, but nobody else at my school was really interested in art or drawing. And so I felt this intense pressure from my environment to kind of conform to what everyone else was doing. And, you know, all of my friends and my peers were kind of telling me that art wasn't really a sustainable career. And as for my parents, you know, I love my parents. They're so incredibly supportive. I couldn't have asked for more for everything that they've done for me throughout the years. Um, but I think at that time in my life, you know, they, uh, they're immigrants, they don't really know much about, you know, what being an artist means or what that can look like. And so when I told them that I was interested in being an artist full time, you know, they were worried for me. They're, they're supportive, but they also were concerned that I might have trouble finding a job in the future, that it might be hard to get employment. And they ended up kind of you know, persuading me or convincing me that it would be a better idea to pursue something else. And so as a result, I ended up going to Carnegie Mellon University with a major in psychology and humanities. So it was like, I was mostly taking psychology classes, uh, intending to become a therapist, but I also had some fine arts classes that I was taking as well. Um, and yeah, it was definitely a rough couple of years. The first two years, I just didn't feel very happy. I wasn't satisfied with what I was studying, what I was doing, and I knew that it wasn't really, it just didn't feel right to me at the time. And I think the thing that kind of was a turning point for me was, I think sometime during my sophomore year, uh, I was just scrolling on Tumblr at like 3 a.m. in the morning, as one does, and I stumbled across this post that I feel like really changed my life. And what it was was basically some artworks by this artist named Tadahiro Uesugi. And when I saw these illustrations, um, it just absolutely blew my mind. I had never seen anything like this before, where these these drawings just felt so incredibly simple and concise and yet they expressed this entire world of feeling and I felt like I was transported to another place when I looked at these drawings um, and after doing more research into this artist I found out that he had worked on movies he had worked on as a blue sky concept artist for Big Hero 6 and Coraline and a bunch of other films. And after learning that this was how he was able to make a living as an artist and support himself, I was like, oh wait, that's totally something that I could try to do as well. And so from that point, it was pretty much a, a shift for me where before I was focused mostly on you know, my psychology degree, my education. Now I was like, I don't give a crap about any of that stuff. I'm just gonna go to class, like do my homework, get it done, whatever. But at the end of the day, I'm going to come back to my dorm room and just focus on drawing, getting better as an artist and start working towards this goal of working in animation. And so here are just some examples of some stuff that I was drawing at that time during college. 
So this was me trying to put together a portfolio. I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> I was just kind of like, I guess, paying attention to what other artists were doing and, and seeing if I could create something, create a portfolio that I felt like could also get me hired. Um, and then once all of my artwork was uploaded and up there, I was like, all right, it's time. Um, I'm going to start applying to every single internship that I possibly can. And so I desperately emailed, applied, like every single major company, small studio, video game studios, graphic design positions. I applied to everything that I possibly could um, over the course of like a year and a half. And every single after every single semester, I was reapplying, reapplying. And after all of that effort, I didn't hear back from anything. It was uh, a complete like loss, I guess. It felt like I had invested so much of my time and I was starting to feel this anxiety because, you know, I was really close to graduation. I was in, you know, my junior year of college at this point and, nothing was really panning out for me. And I started to get scared. I was like, I don't think I'm good enough to do this. I don't think I can, I don't think anyone is going to hire me. And, you know, it was kind of at this point that I fell into this depression where I lost the energy that was pushing me forward. I lost that feeling of inspiration. And mostly I was just being super hard on myself because I think when you do experience that much rejection it's easy to kind of apply that feeling and then think that it means you're worthless as a person like oh my art's not good enough to get me hired I guess that means that I suck and I, I shouldn't exist you know um, which is a really toxic way to think and I don't recommend it at all but that's, that's kind of where I was at that point. Um, but thankfully, you know, uh, I finally, finally got lucky just at the, the very last moment before I, I was about to graduate. And that's when I got an email back from Cartoon Network about being an intern over the summer. And that was the first time that I had heard back from anyone. And I was so relieved because, you know, once after a certain period of time after you graduate, you're not even eligible for these internships anymore. Because if you're not enrolled in school, they, they don't even let you try. So I was like, I was so relieved. Um, I ended up working on two shows at Cartoon Network called Mighty Magiswords and Apple and Onion. And I was working as a production intern, which is basically a role that is mostly based around office work. So I was doing a lot of script reading. I was printing out things. I was making sure that assignments got to artists at the right times. Um, but the cool thing about it was basically getting to see the behind the scenes process of working at a studio. And I got to meet so many artists that I really admired. And I just, I just had a blast. It was amazing. Um, got to explore Los Angeles, go to the beach, go to Gallery Nucleus, which is this bookstore in LA that sells a bunch of like artist goods and that kind of thing. And yeah, I just, I had a really fun time. And as part of the internship, all the interns got to put together a intern pitch, which is basically this exercise of pitching an idea that you have for a show or some other kind of project. So my pitch was called Girl Gang. And uh, a short summary of the idea was that, uh, you know, I was so passionate about shonen anime when I was in high school, but my biggest gripe was always that, like, the token female character was always like the the most poorly written character you know and I really wanted to love them but they were always just written so badly and I was like what if there was a classic shonen anime with the same vibes the same feeling and everything except it was centered around female protagonists so that was kind of the idea behind it and once my internship was over I ended up posting my girl gang pitch online and went back to school to finish up my last semester and halfway through that final semester I got a 
DM on Twitter, basically from a showrunner at DreamWorks asking if I was available for a job at DreamWorks TV uh, on his show, which was called Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts. So this was my first official full-time job. And of course, you know, I accepted it. I ended up moving out to LA to work in-house. Uh, and basically as color designer, my job was I would take these black and white line arts, these character designs, these prop designs, and then I would be responsible for figuring out their base color and also how they would then fit into different color palettes and color schemes throughout the different episodes. So I did the colors for the main model sheets, so Kipo, Wolf, and then all of these special lighting circumstances, special situations. I would also find color palettes that would work for their character designs. So yeah, here are just some more samples of some work that I did while I was there. And here's an example of a special effect. So color design applies to not just characters, but also props, effects, basically anything that requires, uh, that is animated and requires color. And after finishing up at DreamWorks TV, I then started working as a background painter on Steven Universe Future. And this was so incredibly exciting to me because I had been uh, a long time fan of this show before they had reached out to me. And it was actually kind of embarrassing because um, I had a bunch of fan art on my Tumblr. I think I had like a rose pearl drawing on there or something. And I went into the interview and I was like, oh God, like they've definitely seen it, you know, in order to even have you here, they've probably looked through my blog and they've seen all of this fan art. And I, I felt so embarrassed, but hey, I ended up getting the job and I had a great time. Um, basically, my job was to take, again, these like black and white drawings of the environments and then paint them according to whatever the specific mood or the tone was for that scene uh, and get it to fit emotionally within the story. So just as an example, this is um, actually from a paint test that I did to give you an idea of what this process is like. So it starts off with a rough storyboard of what's happening. Then it's handed off to a layout artist who is then going to draw the actual background very nice and clean and prepared for color. Um, and then your art director might give you directions for how they want you to paint it. So for example, here, you know, it says Beach City Water Tower and the palette dramatic sunset. So, you know, they want it to feel lovely and inviting. They want to have light being cast onto the ground in some way. And then you paint it and try to interpret the mood and emotion that the directors want and see how you can then interpret that into your actual background. So here are just some more samples of work that I did um, while I was on the show, just some more background paintings from various episodes. And so for, uh, for these, this particular episode, I actually got color keys from my art director. So these are by Liz Artinian. And basically she already kind of had this vision or idea for what she wanted the color palette to be. And I would then use these as reference and then flesh them out into the actual background paintings. So as you can see, it's got that same color palette inspiration, but just with a little bit more detail and richness so that it feels fully fleshed out. And after that, I then went on to work on my first film, which was Luck at Skydance. Um, this one was an interesting production to work on because I was actually there much earlier on. And so I was working with a different iteration of the film. The director that I had was different from the director who ended up uh, helming the final version of the movie and the idea behind the film was also different. It was supposed to be like a spy comedy at that time and I mostly did environment paintings and color keys. So here are just some of some drawings from that earlier version. So you 
If you've seen this movie, the current version of it on Apple TV, you probably won't recognize any of this stuff because it is from uh, an older idea that they had for this film. Um, but yes, here are just some of the work that I did. These are kind of, these are um, little paintings based off of storyboard drawings by Louis Del Carmen. And the idea was just to give a sense of mood and atmosphere to help pitch the film to distributors. So at that time, they were looking for someone to purchase the rights of the movie. And I kind of painted these as an example of, oh, here's kind of what we want the story to feel like. After that, I worked as a background painter at Netflix on a show called We Lost Our Human. And this show uh, still hasn't come out yet. Uh, I'm hoping it does soon. It's really cute. It's kind of a choose your own adventure. So as you watch through the episodes, you actually get to pick different routes depending on what you want to see the characters doing. So it's a interactive TV special in that way. And that finally brings me to where I, I am right now, which is a visit artist on uh, Across the Spider-Verse. And by far, this is the most challenging, humbling, difficult, but rewarding thing that I've ever worked on. And as a visual development artist, I kind of do like everything or most things, I guess. So this includes concept design, environment paintings, props, textures, color keys, even some character outfit design here and there. So basically anything that needs to get done needs to be visualized and put into the movie. Um, that's something that I might be working on. And obviously because the movie's not out yet, I can't really show you know, that much of my work. However, I can show you these screenshots from the trailer that I drew and worked on. Um, and these are literally taken right from the trailer, which is why they're kind of blurry. Uh, but these, these four frames here are called uh, a burst card, which is basically just um, a little flash. It's like during a very impactful moment of the trailer or of an action scene, you'll kind of feel this little flash and it's kind of subconscious. You can't really see the individual frames, but you feel the energy of it. And um, my assignment here was basically to draw these frames in the style of 2099's universe, which is heavily inspired by Sid Mead and um, concept illustrations from the 70s and 80s. So they've got, kind of got this like markery look to them, uh, this gouache acrylic paint sort of look. Um, and yeah, that was that's kind of the idea behind the, the verse card. All right, so that's pretty much my self-introduction and an explanation of my art journey. And so now I wanted to move on and kind of go into my advice. Basically the things that I would say to any aspiring artists out there or anyone who is interested in working in animation or in games in the future. So before, Anything else, there's two questions that I want all of you guys to ask yourself because this is key. This is essential. And once you figure out what your answer to these two questions is, it's going to make the rest of your journey and your progression way, way easier. So the first question is, why do you make art? So, and, and what I mean by that is, what is it, why is it that you are making art and you are not making, I don't know, donuts or you're not a, a professional engineer or you're not a musician? What is it about visual arts specifically that draws you to it? What is the goal that you have when you're drawing? Second question is, what would you not hate doing for 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year? And what I mean by this is I think that a lot of jobs seem really cool from the outside. And I think that artists have a tendency to often portray only the best parts of these jobs or the best parts of working. And a lot of the negative stuff you tend to hide. You don't really want to share that on social media because 
you know, there's a lot of reasons. Like, first of all, it, it doesn't feel good to put out negativity sometimes. And second of all, what if you complain on social media and then someone who has employed you in the past sees it and they're like, oh, you had an awful time. Guess I don't want to work with you in the future. There's this fear it'll it'll hurt your chances of getting jobs if, if you talk about the bad stuff. Um, but the reality of it is, you know, these jobs seem glamorous, but they're still jobs at the end of the day. You're going to have to deal with management issues. You're going to be doing the same thing day in, day out a lot of the time. And so I think it's important to pick something to do that you don't think you're going to get sick of after doing it for weeks and weeks and eventually months and then years. So for me personally, my answer to these questions would be, uh, when I ask myself, why do I make art? My answer would be to capture a moment or feeling in time. I think that's always my goal. Whenever I'm creating something, I have an emotion that I want to communicate and my art is the vehicle for that emotion or for that moment in time. And the second question is, what would you not hate doing 40 hours a week? And for me, that's anything involving color, paint and lighting. So um, I'm, I am not really that into design, for example, or line drawing or character design. Sure, I might like to do it occasionally for fun if it's for myself, but if I had, if I had to have a boss and I had deadlines and I had people to answer to, I definitely would not want to be doing those things as a full-time job just because I know I would get burnt out very easily. So for me, I really love color and paint and lighting. So that's kind of what my personal focus is. So what this is, is now your artist mission statement. So you combine your answers to those two questions and you put them together and you say, my artist mission statement is dot 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 blank. So for me, it's I want to capture a moment and feeling in time through the usage of color and lighting. So now that I've got my artist mission statement, you know, that makes my progression, my journey a lot clearer because now I have a direction to focus on. And now I know what is kind of at the core of my artist identity and what separates me from everyone else that might be looking for a job, right? Like there's probably thousands of people that all want to be biz dev artists, or there's thousands of people that all want to be background painters, but there's only one copy of you. There's only one version of you and your art and your artist mission statement is what makes you unique and separates you from everybody else. So once you've got that figured out, then it's time for you to make art. And I would say there's two kinds of methods that I usually see people going about doing this. And the first one is what I like to call the cram a skill method. And this is where you spend all of your time doing countless studies per day, trying to focus on a singular skill. So let's say you're like, uh, I don't know how to draw people. I really wanna be a character designer. I'm gonna do hundreds of anatomy studies and, and copies every day. And I'm gonna be really consistent about it and, and just do a ton of these you know, copies of other drawings, these other studies. So uh, if this works for you, no shade whatsoever. I'm super happy for you if this is a method that you go by and it works. Um, but for me personally, I've tried this so many times. I, I really want this to work for me, but I've just never been able to because I always end up getting burnt out. I get bored. Maybe I'll do it for like three or four days in a row. And then on the fifth day, I just stop and I never pick it up again. And I think the reason is that it just, I don't have the passion for it. I'm just not, uh, it's hard for me to get that spark of inspiration and feel like I wanna do these studies. And I also feel like these are not really that helpful to include in an overall portfolio when you're done. Um, because oftentimes you can't just include studies that you've done of other people's artwork and then put them in your portfolio because it's not something that you entirely came up with on your own or drew. 
And if your entire portfolio is just studies, it can be hard to tell what your actual level of skill is, uh, which is why I prefer this method, with, which I call the mission statement method, which is basically where you just draw whatever you want to draw and you will learn and pick up those skills naturally as you go along. So I personally find this to be a lot more fun. It's a lot more inspiring to me because I'm drawing stuff that I would be drawing anyways, but it just so happens that as I go, I end up learning things in the process of making that thing. And everything that you make using this process is going to align with who you are as an artist because you're always keeping your mission statement in mind. So for example, with this piece, right? Um, I drew it because I wanted to communicate this certain feeling, this emotion of this guy, the salary man and a cat, you know, on this kind of rainy, gloomy, moody sort of day in, in Tokyo. And even though my goal was not specifically to work on perspective or lighting or composition, those are all things that just naturally ended up happening as I was working on it. Because I was like, oh, you know, how, how can I communicate this feeling I want? Maybe I should do some research or look for reference for color palettes or look for reference for perspective. Um, and it just ends up happening kind of organically. And because it's organic, you don't get burnt out and tired of it because you're not just doing 20 million perspective studies all at the same time. So now that you have your artist mission statement and you've got some work done, your next step is going to be to design and curate your portfolio. So generally you're going to wanna to keep it focused. You're gonna to wanna to keep it to your best work and you're gonna to wanna to keep it recent. And if there's any work in your portfolio that doesn't align with what your mission statement is, I would just completely take it out. You absolutely don't need it. So here is a screenshot of my current website page. Um, yeah, it's pretty much uh, my main page is just all of my personal illustrations, all of the drawings that I feel most proud of, that I feel like represent my artist identity and who I am as an artist. And an example of something that I wouldn't include would be a drawing like this, because first of all, this is an old drawing. I made it in 2017, so it's definitely not my best work. I would say it doesn't really align with my artist mission statement because it's, you know, while it, it does kind of have some nice color and lighting, it's not really clear what I'm supposed to be feeling. I'm not getting a clear story from this image the way that I would for some of my more recent pieces. And for that reason, I feel like it's not really aligned with who I am right now. And it's also showcasing a skill that I'm not interested in being hired for, which is character drawing. So, you know, we've got this girl like front and center. I'm not really interested in being a character artist. So I'm just not going to put it in my portfolio um, in order to not mix up my message. So on your portfolio site, you're also going to want to make your goals clear and make it easy to understand what it is exactly that you want to do and what you're trying to get hired for. And this is because the animation industry and also the games industry, any other form of entertainment is highly specialized. And so you have all kinds of positions for all kinds of artists for these really specialized skills, you know? Like you'll have one artist just for drawing a layout and one artist just for painting that layout and one artist just for modeling props. And because of that, you're going to have the best chance of landing a job by showing that you are a master of a couple of skills rather than just being okay at everything. However, I know having said that, that there are so many people out there who like to do everything. And, you know, my boyfriend is one of those people, for example. He loves everything. He loves animation. He loves character design. He loves drawing backgrounds. He loves storyboarding. He loves everything. And so for a person like that, what do you do if you can't decide what it is exactly that you like the most? Well, in that case, my answer to you would be to find whatever the common ground is 
between all of your areas of interest. So all of these artworks are by the artist Zadig, who I kind of thought of because I feel like his artwork encompasses so many different fields, you know? He's good at everything. He's great at character design. He has done a lot of work on his video game in terms of drawing and designing props and environments. He's also done visual development for movies. He's done color keys. He's done pretty much everything. But I feel like even though his interests are really varied, the common ground between everything he does is this feeling of world building. I think everything that, everything he draws feels like it belongs to this fantastical world or this place. And it's really imaginative. And I can tell that's something that he is probably really passionate about. And so if you are similar and you also have interest in a lot of things, figure out what that common theme is between you know, all of those interests and then have that kind of be the, the focus or the guiding point of your portfolio. So for portfolio organization, I would say to organize it based off of what makes the most sense to you. So if you're somebody who has a lot of, maybe maybe you already know what, you, what skill it is you wanna focus on. So for example, like me, I know that I love anything to do with color and lighting. Uh, it might make the most sense to divide by project. So on your site, you're gonna have like a bunch of sub pages for all of the different projects you have, stuff that you've worked on and have that be the way that people can kind of peruse your work. On the other hand, if you're someone who has a ton of skills and that's more so how you want your work to be divided up, then you can have different pages for those skills. So for example, character design, background design, background painting, you can just make different pages for each of those. Um, next up, I wanna talk a little bit about social media. Um, I would say that social media is helpful, but it shouldn't be your main focus, uh, it, just in the sense that, you know, having good art and being happy and proud of your work, in my opinion, is more important than having a social media following or trying really hard to get that follower count to increase. So keeping all that in mind, you know, take this social media advice with a grain of salt, because of course, the number one most important thing is to work on your art um, on your own. Uh, but basically, if you were to post online, I'd say draw often, post often and engage with your community. This one is really important. And I think um, I owe a lot of my success and, and a lot of where I am today, thanks to all of my online friends and my peers throughout the years that have lifted me up in various ways, whether that's leaving nice comments on my artwork when I felt really terrible about myself, or if that's recommending me to someone when they knew that I was looking for a job. Um, it's really important just to make sure that you are giving back to your community and you know, fostering relationships with people in a way that feels genuine and authentic. So what I mean by that is um, I, think, I think that people can tell if your only motive in making friends with someone is because you are trying to get closer to them as a way, as a means of getting a job. And I would say that while, you know, that's something that we're all concerned with, I would say try instead to focus more on uplifting other people's art and making friends organically through shared interests. So for example, a couple of years ago, I got really into Fire Emblem Three Houses and I ended up making a bunch of friends who were in the Fire Emblem fandom and we ended up talking. And then through that, I kind of organically made friendships and connections with people. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I mean when I say engage with your community. Um, in terms of other tips, I would say 
stuff that helped for me was finding my best posting time. For me, it's 9 a.m. For you, it might be something different. I think the reason why 9 a.m. works that well for me is because here on the West Coast, that's when people are just, you know, about to start their work for the day and they like check their Twitter or Instagram before work. And then three hours later it, uh, on the East Coast, it's like three hours later, it's like 12 p.m. And that's lunch break. And that's when people are checking their phones during lunch. So I think that's why I tend to have the most engagement for my artwork at this particular time. Uh, I'd also recommend participating in visibility hashtags. So for example, hashtag portfolio day, I know is a really popular one. Recruiters and other people in the industry will often check it and, and look at it to find new artists that they can hire. Uh, have a dedicated art account, make your art easy to find. This is a big one because especially with a platform like Twitter, oftentimes, um, because there might be a lot of other personal tweets or photos of your cat or something like that. You know, if a recruiter comes to your page and only has like 30 seconds to browse your profile, if it's really hard to find where your artwork is, they might pass you up altogether, even if your artwork is really good. So I'd say, you know, keep the personal stuff for sure, but then also have a separate art account just for your artwork um, to make it as easy as possible for people to find it. Same with your contact info, put that right in your header or in your bio. You can use a link in bio service as well. I was using one called Linktree for a while that I really liked. Uh, and also keep your DMs open. This one is huge because 90% uh, of my jobs I have gotten through Twitter DM. And that's not an exaggeration. Um, my very first job at DreamWorks, I got from the showrunner DMing me on Twitter. And my current job on Spider-Verse also started through a Twitter DM. Uh, the production designer at the time reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in coming in for an interview. And that was all through social media. So definitely leave those DMs open because it's a popular way for people to contact you. Uh, in terms of other methods for applying for jobs, you know, there's the classic apply via website, which uh, personally, that's never worked for me. I've never got any responses back from anything that I applied to on a website. I don't even know if people check them at this point, but you know, it's there. If you already have the materials anyway, it'll take like 10 minutes to apply. Um, I think a more useful strategy that worked for me was cold emailing recruiters. So basically what that means is, um, if you can find the email addresses for specific companies or you know whoever the artist recruiter or artist manager is at that particular studio, then you can go ahead and send them an email and say, hey, I'm looking for, or I'm interested in being hired for so-and-so job. Please let me know if there are any positions that you think would be a good fit for me. So cold emailing is pretty much all that I was doing when I was in college, trying to get my first internship. And I would say, again, like nobody really responded to this, but I did get a couple of freelance opportunities from doing this. So I definitely think it's worth trying if you have the time. And this is just an example of like uh, what a contact email list might look like. I obviously blurred out the names and emails for privacy reasons, but I have a, a spreadsheet on my computer where I basically just keep track of all of these artist managers that I've worked with in the past or have expressed interest in working with me or that I want to work with so that whenever I'm like, hey, I kind of you know, I'm looking for work right now. It's time for me to go on to my next job. Then I know who to reach out to and ask if they have any availability. Because a lot of these times, these jobs are through word of mouth. They don't publicly advertise these job openings sometimes. And the only way to know if there is one is just to reach out and to ask. And I want to kind of conclude today's presentation by saying that success is 90% hard work 
but then 10% being in the right place at the right time. So you can be an absolutely amazing, fantastic artist, like the best in the world, but none of that matters if you don't have that 10% luck to get you where you want to go. Um, the timing is really important. Factors such as like, oh, is your style just the thing they need for a TV show that is starting to hire right now? And if that timing works out right, then that can kind of be the thing to get your foot in the door. Um, but I also kind of take this as a comforting thing because I think it means you know, you don't need to be so hard on yourself if you haven't had that opportunity yet or if you haven't gotten lucky because as long as you continue working hard and as long as you are having fun making art, um, that's all that really matters and the success will follow you as you go. So focus on what you love about art and, you know, I think the the better and better you get at it, the more comfortable you get with yourself. Other people are going to take notice of your passion and you're going to find that success that you're looking for. Uh, and life is just too short to hate yourself, you know? Uh, like I've definitely been through that whole thing of imposter syndrome. And, you know, that's something I still struggle with to this day of often feeling like I'm not good enough or my art's not good enough or, you know, questioning why I'm even here. But I think that that's something I want to work on. And it's something I hope everyone else can think about too, is just, you know, life is too short. Just enjoy, enjoy yourself, enjoy your passion, your artwork. And um, that's pretty much uh, all I have to say for today's presentation. So I think I'm gonna hand it off to uh, women in animation over here for the question and answer segment. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Yeah, this will conclude the presentation portion and now we'll move into Q and A's. Um, and we've sort of figured the best way to do this would be, because there's quite a lot of people in here, um, to put your question in the chat. Um, but we do have the option for the hand raise feature on Zoom if you want to verbally ask your question. Um, so we're just going to probably go back and forth. Me and Charlize, our other uh, eboard member, will be going through those. Um, but uh, we'll be going through them as they come up. And we'll leave about 30 minutes for that. Um, and I'll set a timer for that if, if that sounds good. So. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Let's see, we already have some coming in. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you can read this too, Kat, if you would, if you'd like me to read them for you or if you wanna Oh, go through I mean, I absolutely, <laughs> I can totally uh, take charge and read the chat out loud. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how the hand raise feature works. Do I have to like click on something or? Um, it's we can monitor that for you and then tell you who's like raising their hand. Uh -huh. um, okay. Sure. That but helps. yeah, if you want to answer a few in the chat, and then we have one hand raised, so maybe like two or three questions from chat, and then we can move to Safia, who has her hand raised in Zoom. So. Okay. Sure. Sounds good. Sure. All right. I'm gonna just start from the top here. Um. So Neha asks, if you hadn't gotten that internship at CN, what would you have done instead? If you still wanted to get into animation. Um, honestly, if I hadn't gotten that internship, I probably would have just gone on to graduate school and finished that whole thing of becoming a therapist, um, because I think that it was not really an option for me at the time. Like if I couldn't get a job out of school, I knew that I wouldn't be able to just be unemployed for very long. I probably would have continued uh, with my psychology education. Um, but I'm sure that that passion or that desire to pursue art would have stayed with me the whole time. And I probably would still be drawing in my free time, still submitting things, trying to get my foot in the door. Um, but it would probably just look different because like I was saying, after you graduate, you're not really eligible for internships anymore. So I probably would have just had to apply to jobs outright and that kind of thing. Next question, Ricardo asks, once you join a company, are you automatically enrolled in a guild? 
Uh, it depends. So here in Los Angeles, we have our own local animation guild that a lot of studios are part of. So major studios like Disney, DreamWorks, Sony. Are all part of too. Uh, they're all part of this guild. So uh, as long as you're working for one of those major companies, you will have uh, guild protection and health insurance and that kind of thing. Um, but there's also a lot of smaller indie companies or companies outside of LA that are not unionized. So for example, I believe Pixar doesn't actually have a guild. Uh, they're located up in the Bay Area and they are not currently unionized. As far as I know, <laughs> I might be wrong, but the last time I heard about it, I don't think they are. Um, next question, Michelle asks, who are your main inspirations or artists for painting light and colors? Where do you think is the good place to start? Um, wow, yeah, there's so many. Like, I don't even know where to begin listing my favorite artists because there are so many artists that inspire me, but definitely the one I talked about in my presentation, Tadahiro Uesugi is probably up there in terms of favorites of all time. Um, I think, some other people that inspire me are actually, I really love um, like wood block, like Japanese wood block artists from the 1800s. Um, uh, there's one named Hiroshi Yoshida, I believe, but he has these really incredible, beautiful wood block artworks that looks so contemporary. And I just, I think for me, I always am interested in color and light uh, in the sense of how it's being used to tell a narrative or to accomplish some kind of story. And so I think that's kind of what I'm attracted to. And in terms of learning about color and light, um, yeah, uh, study films for sure. Pay attention to, you know, when you see a really cool piece of artwork show up on your timeline, ask yourself, why is this so appealing to me and kind of analyze, okay, what about these color choices are communicating this specific emotion to me? Um, I think that's good, uh, a good place to start from like a mental level. Um, but then there's also tons of resources and stuff that you can check out uh, as well, um, which are hard for me to think off the top of my head right now, but there's so many amazing classes out there. Um, I'm teaching one right now about color and light, but I've also taken color and light classes myself. There was one on schoolism called, um, I think it was, it was Tonko House, Tonko House, like understanding color and light. That one was amazing. There's also a Nathan Fox class on schoolism about that as well. So there's a ton of resources out there for you to check out. Uh, and I think this is kind of related to the next question, which is how did you develop such good color sense? Was it from doing lots of film studies, observational plein air? And I think that's part of my answer to the previous question, which was just, you know, I would see an artwork that really inspired me and I'd be like, oh, something about this. What is it about the color that really makes me feel this way? And I would just kind of try to interrogate that and then replicate that feeling in my own artwork. Um, should okay. we, yeah, yeah, should we take we can the hand wave questions? Yeah, I uh, see. Sophia uh, had her, or, or had their hand raised yeah. first. Sophia, if you wanna go ahead. Hello, um, Hello. I just, had a general question when it came to you know job searching you mentioned that you before you became like a light uh, a color color or like a prop designer that you were actually a production designer or a, a script uh review or something to that degree and i was like wondering is that like generally what certain artists tend to go through that process first before they end up at the position they want to be or is there like you know a, a gunshot way to get into the position you want to be without, um, you know, having networking issues, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the job you're referring to is probably my internship that I had at Cartoon Network. So when I was an intern, I was doing a lot of that, um, like, you know, manual work of printing out scripts and like handing them out and taking notes at meetings, that kind of thing. And I would say that 
everyone kind of has their own path. I think for some people, they're able to get a job out of college right away, working in whatever their desired field of choice is. But for a lot of people, you know, you might apply for something that is related or at the same studio, but not necessarily what your end goal is uh, in terms of your job. And I think it's it's fairly common um, for people to start off like that and maybe work a few years as like a production assistant or production coordinator role before then switching over into doing art or modeling or directing or whatever it is that they're really, really passionate about. So hopefully okay. that answers the question. Um, I think it's open ended. It's like it, everyone has their own different path. Yeah. I just, I've heard that question, I've heard that answer to question more than anything out of, um, you know, trying to apply for jobs like that. And then is it okay if I ask one more simple question? It's not really yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So like, what would be your age limit for artworks to present on your portfolio? Oh, you know what? I mean, <laughs> personally. Because generally I, they ask for yeah. like seven to 10 years, but if it's like, you know, between like a two to three year period, is it like, you know, it depends upon the job application? Mm -hmm. I personally would say it depends on how fast you feel like you're progressing as an artist. Um, because for me, I've had periods of time where maybe I was busy with life or with other things and I just wouldn't draw as much. I just didn't have that much time. And so from year to year, my drawings didn't look that different from each other. But then I would go through a six month period of having a ton of free time and being really inspired. And then my artwork would just like jump up from here and it would just shoot all the way up and like, oh my God, I would get so much better. And I think in that case, it kind of depends like, you know, have you experienced like a really recent growth spurt in your in your art journey? If so, maybe you should only be including your most recent stuff from like the last year or two. But if it's more so like you feel like you've kind of had a gradual improvement, then I feel like, yeah, five, six years, that's probably OK. And I think for me, I'd say my cutoff limit is just basically embarrassment, like cut it off at the point where I start <laughs> <laughs> if it's a drawing that I would cringe at if someone that I really looked up to saw it like for example um what I was saying about my uh, interview at Cartoon Network like I had so much fan art on my tumblr they probably saw it I was so embarrassed like anything like that you don't want them seeing don't have it in your portfolio okay I will keep that in mind thank you yeah, no problem yeah and I think we have one more hand raise from Hayden. If you want to go ahead and unmute. Yep. Hello. Hello. There we go. Well, let me turn on my camera as well. I probably don't need it, but. Oh, hello? Can you hello? see me? Yeah, we can still hear you. Okay. I can't see, but. I, I can hear you. I can't really see your video, but I can hear you just fine. Oh, okay. I, I don't know what's wrong with the video, but. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm kind of in the same boat as a used to be cat with looking for internships. I've been applying to art related internships on Indeed for the summer. But would you say it's better to just focus more on my social media? Like, how would I go about finding jobs through social media? Um, I would say it. <laughs> It's definitely like, I wish there was like a surefire solution or thing that I could say to be like, hey, do this and I guarantee you'll get a job through social media. But I feel like it's really tough. It's that 10% luck thing I was saying where, you know, all you can do is work hard, just put in that effort. And then if you get that 10% luck, that's what it's going to take to kind of get you that job. Um, so I guess my advice would be if your goal right now, if, if the traditional method of applying to inter internships isn't working out for you right now, you can definitely try shifting your focus more to social media and just posting a ton, um, again, like engaging with your community, all of those social media tips I was talking about would be really, really helpful. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's so, it's so tricky because it's like, you never know with social media, you never know when, when something is going to be a hit or not. It's like, I could make two drawings and really love a drawing and post it. And it gets like 
I don't know, 500 likes or something. And then I might post something else that I didn't spend as much time on. And that one goes viral and gets like 50,000 likes or something. So there's no, I wish there was like a method or a way to say this will guarantee you social media success or guarantee you, you know, like recruiter attention. But at the end of the day, some of the very best artists that I know, you know, who I really, really look up to, they have like 30 followers on Instagram and their Instagram is like 90% photos of their dogs or like sunsets or something. So definitely don't stress out too much about it, I think is my advice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then we can shift back to some of the chat. I think we left off at Isabel. Um, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. If you want Sounds to take it from good. there. Yeah. So Isabel's question, do you think you have to move to California in order to break into the industry? Uh, no, definitely not. Especially with the pandemic. I think the pandemic changed so many things with how the animation industry currently works. Um, and since the time of, of the pandemic happening, so many of my coworkers are actually like international. Um, I've worked with artists who live in France, London, South Korea, Canada, the East Coast. You definitely don't need to be in Los Angeles anymore in order to break in. I think that if you are trying to get your foot in the door and you have the means and the, the money to move here and try to network in person, that's certainly something you can do. But at the same time, I also recognize that it takes an incredible amount of privilege to be able to afford that kind of move. Because living in LA is so incredibly expensive. Like I, I can't even begin to fathom how anyone would be able to live here without also having full-time employment. So. I think the good news is that definitely these days you can just get discovered through social media and then work remotely and you never have to step foot in Los Angeles. So I think that is a great thing about these days. Um, the next question from Tegan, uh, how did you really know when you had found your style? I feel like I don't have a style. Um, yeah, I don't know. Style is such a, a weird thing. I think that I never, I don't really feel like I have figured out, I, I don't ever think there's an end point where I'm like, ah, yes, this is my style. This is how I draw. This is it. I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm going to draw like this for the rest of my life. I think for me, I feel like my art, I'm always finding new things that I'm interested in or new techniques that I'm incorporating into my artwork. Uh, for example, I feel like for the last four years or so, I've kind of been working in a more graphic, um, blocky, chunky style with really flat colors and lighting. Um, but more recently, I've been getting more interested in traditional media. So watercolor techniques, I've been trying to find ways to digitally incorporate that into my artwork. And I feel like my style is maybe evolving, changing, shifting. So I think it's a, it's a living thing. It's always, it's always moving. Uh, so I think, you know, there's no need to worry if you feel like you don't have a style. I think the more that you keep drawing and exposing yourself to things that inspire you, the more that's naturally going to come out. And I think a style is really just an accumulation of observations that you've made from things that inspire you, right? So, you know, I guess an easy example would be like with character design. Um, maybe you really like the way that eyes are drawn in Sailor Moon, but then you really love how round and fluid the characters are in like classic Disney animation. You end up kind of uh, combining some of those aesthetics together in your own artwork, and then that's how your style is born. It's like your own unique take on all of these things that you enjoy. Uh, next question from L is, my art account has all artwork, but it is fan art and drawings made for fun. Should I make a new art account or keep my current account? Um, I think it's up to you. It's, it's just purely based off of whether or not, you know, you feel like you want to have a separation between your professional life and your personal life, or if you don't really mind mixing all of that stuff together. 
Um, I know for me, like I used to use my Tumblr for mostly fan art and that kind of thing. And I still use that same Tumblr. Now I just post whatever I'm drawing now. So there isn't really a, a hard distinction there. Um, but at the same time, you know, I know a lot of people who do decide to split it apart. And yeah, I think it just depends on what you're comfortable with. I think recruiters don't really care. Like, uh, I guess they don't care in the sense that as long as your art is good, it doesn't really matter what you're drawing. You know, like you could be drawing 90% Pokemon drawings, but if they're really, really good Pokemon drawings, like you could still, you know, they're still going to be interested in. And there's people who got hired onto their favorite TV shows or their favorite movies based off of their fan art. Um, so, you know, I'd say don't be afraid of having fan art if that's something you're really passionate about. Um, Kennedy asks, will we be able to watch the recording if we miss in the Zoom? So uh, I'll take the, I'll let you guys take this one away because I'm not actually sure. <laughs> yeah, we're, we've recorded the entire Zoom. Um, we'll be posting it to YouTube, I think. And if you follow us, we're, at wea.asu, um, which we'll plug all that at the end in the chat. Um, you can watch the whole thing through. So yeah, we'll have it. Mm -hmm. And then let's see, we have about 15 minutes left for Q and A. Um, so if you're good to keep continuing, then yeah, absolutely. Good great. to keep going. Yeah. All right. Um, I might be a little more picky with the questions, so yeah, if I notice definitely. some that are kind of repetitive, I might just skip it and move on. Yep. Um, Sounds good. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, I think we stopped at Luvia. Or... Yeah, okay. Right, okay. So it's also kind of about my internship experience. Um, Do you make the plan to visit California before getting accepted? No, so I only moved to California. For, so first I was only here for like two months. So my internship was just two months long. I found like an Airbnb that I was able to rent for those two months and just live there. Um, and then after getting my first job at DreamWorks, that's when I officially decided to move and, you know, get all my stuff over to California. So I definitely waited until I had the job first. Um, Elle asks, did you have to move around outside California every time you switched companies? Is it common to switch between studios? So again, now because of the pandemic, I feel like this isn't as important anymore. You can work remotely. Common to switch between studios? Definitely. I've worked, like, I've been working in animation for five years, and in that time, I've worked for just as many companies. I think five companies full-time. So it is really, really common to switch because when you're at a studio working on a job, you are only hired for the length of your project. So if I were hired for a season of a TV show, I might only have a job for like a year. And then as soon as that year is up, they're like, all right, bye. <laughs> go figure yourself out. We're, we're dropping you. You have to go figure something. So that's I think that's why there's such a, a high rate of people jumping around is because you always have to be searching for your next gig. Um, I'm going to skip this one about tips for finding internships because I feel like I talked about that one already. Next one is, um, hello, I never thought of Twitter as an art resource. Do you think Twitter would be a better option to make my art scene? Do you think it's better than Instagram in terms of visibility and community? Yes, I do think that Twitter is much, much better at you know, finding friends, building a community, that kind of thing, just because of the nature of the platform. And like I was saying, 90% of my jobs have come from Twitter DMs. And I think it's because Twitter has that retweet function. So it's really easy for people to share your artwork and have that kind of spread around. And it's easy for people to discover you um, versus Instagram, where, you know, Instagram kind of sucks. Like, I'm sorry to say it, it kind of sucks. The, the explore page is just a, a total mess. Um, I never see any of my friends' posts. It's always like random ads and stuff from people I don't even follow appearing at the top. Um, so I think that Twitter is definitely better for, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it is unfortunate, all the stuff that's happening right now. Uh, cough, cough, you know, Elon. So that's really a bummer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say as of right now, it still is, is the best choice uh, for getting your artwork out there. 
Um, do you think having experience at smaller studios helps you to get internships at larger studios? I'm thinking of applying to some that are more local to me before applying to bigger places. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. Any kind of experience at all is super helpful to have because that's something that you can then put on your resume, talk about in your portfolio, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think you should go for it for sure. Um, Alyssa is asking me a specific question about my class, about certain software. You don't need any software. Um, I use Photoshop. I'll be teaching in Photoshop. So I'd recommend getting that if you, if you want, but you could also use Clip Studio Paint or Procreate or whatever. Um, no other supplies necessary. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you, uh, Isabel asks, do you think that you need a side hustle or a second job in order to work in animation? A lot of the artists I follow sell artwork, merch, classes on the side, as well as working full-time in animation. Do you think it'll be necessary? Um, I would say it depends. It really depends because, you know, this, the spectrum of jobs in animation and how well they pay is so large. Um, to, to share a little bit about, you know, my own job history, I will definitely say that when I started in animation, I was making like minimum wage. I was not making that much money at all. And it was, you know, just enough that I could maybe, you know, pay rent and buy my groceries and survive, but I really wasn't saving any money. Um, but as I've kind of jumped from studio to studio and started getting more jobs, definitely, you know, my pay rate has also been increasing along with my experience. And now I think I'm at a point where I can just comfortably work full time and I don't have to do all this other stuff. Uh, the reason why I am you know, selling prints and teaching a class is because I want to. It's just a passion for me. And it's also because I really like or I really want to have time to invest and focus on my own personal artwork. So that's a choice that I make because I want to, not because I'm really forced to have a side hustle. But I will say that when I was first starting out in animation, yeah, it was really tough. I think back then, probably if you know my situation hadn't improved by this point, I probably would have to look for a second job or at least be doing freelancing uh, on the weekends or something like that. Um, Brianna asked, did you ever find it daunting when you decided you wanted to work in the animation industry? How much time did you spend working on your art before you were able to land a full-time job or something similar? Um, it's hard because I feel like I already had sort of an advantage just in the sense that I had been drawing in Photoshop since I was 13 years old. So I'd been digitally drawing, posting on DeviantArt from a really, really young age. And so in some ways I already kind of had this history or this background that I was able to build off of when I decided that I wanted to pursue animation. Um, but I would say in terms of time that I spent actively drawing, as soon as I decided that it was like two years of really, really focused, intense portfolio work and, you know, trying to accomplish as much as I could outside of class. It was about two years of that time. Paul asks, are there any offers you had to turn down for any reason? And on a similar note, are there things to look out for when considering an employer? Oh um, yeah, oh my gosh, more than I can count. I've had to turn down so many things that I really would have liked to work on or would have been a really cool opportunity because the timing wasn't right or because I had already committed to another project. Um, so for example, I remember when I was working on Kipo, I got an offer to work on the Owl House, which I think at the time was in its really early stages of production or was just staffing up, they asked if I would want to join. And I had to say, no, I had to turn it down because I had already accepted a role on Steven Universe. So it was just, you know, the timing just didn't really work out that well. And in terms of things to look out for when considering an employer, definitely ask them questions about work-life balance. I think the main, the biggest thing that 
kind of that you have to look out for in terms of jobs is just how they're going to treat you what the expectations are I would definitely like unfortunately all studios contain a degree of crunch and overwork and burnout like that's inevitable I don't think I've ever worked at a studio that didn't have some have a little bit of that in some form or aspect but what you can look for is art directors who you think are going to protect you people who you think are going to have your back and try and prevent that crunch from affecting you as much as possible and so you know you can ask them questions like what does your company do to avoid artists working overtime or do you guys have like a flexible work hours policy those kinds of things are really good to ask if you're kind of in that negotiation stage. Um, um, so sorry to jump in, but we have about five minutes left um, and mm -hmm. then we can conclude. So if you, that's probably enough time to answer like one or two quick ones or one long one or whatever you, whatever okay. you feel, so. Absolutely, maybe I'll look for a really good question then. Let me just scroll through and okay. see if there's anything else that I really want to answer. Okay. I think there's only, there's like a few more left and they're all kind of similar. So I think this should be okay. So Ricardo asks, can we use Procreate in the animation industry? Um, I would say the industry standard is Photoshop. So um, you can use Procreate if you're like a freelancer or if you are like a illustrator or something like that and you don't really have to hand off your files to another person. But gen generally speaking, because animation is so collaborative, they do kind of ask everything be in Photoshop because that just makes it a lot easier to you know, share your PSDs with your coworkers. And I think that covers the next question as well. Photoshop is the industry standard. Um, um, Maria asks, how did you start doing freelance or how did you approach it, if that makes sense? Um, I think that it just kind of happened as I was also working full time. I would randomly maybe get offers uh, from people asking if I was available for freelance and then I would end up doing a gig for two or three weeks. So um, in terms of how I approached it, it, it was just kind of like, you know, you, Monday through Friday, I'm doing my full time job, maybe on the weekends or after work, I would, you know, get some of that freelance work done, turn it in, they would send me an email back with notes, it, it seemed pretty straightforward. Uh, so hopefully that helps if that's something that you are thinking of doing. Um, and I think I've gotten to the bottom of the chat. I'm not really seeing any more questions. Oh, here's one. Michelle asks, what kind of negotiations would you ask for now that you've worked on more projects? Um, I think that it, <laughs> probably these days, I would request the ability to work from home as much as I want. I think especially because of the pandemic. Um, for me personally, I find it much more comfortable to work at home, even though I do miss getting to socialize with coworkers and that sort of thing. The benefits of getting to work in my own space and not have to commute every day in the horrible traffic, that just far outweighs the benefits for me of being in-house. So um, that's definitely something that I'm going to try to negotiate for in the future is just to have that flexibility to be able to come in when I want and then stay home when I want to. Um, and Isabel also asked, do you have to work at the studio when you start out? It depends. It's from studio to studio, you know, they have different policies. And I think it also depends what kind of job you have. So working as like a background painter or a vis dev artist, 90% of the time, it's just me staring at a tablet. I could do that from anywhere. I could do that from the office. I could do that from Starbucks. Like, why do I have to be in the office to stare at my screen and draw things? Um, but if you have a more collaborative job, like if you're an art director, or if your job is to like, take a lot of notes and like help to phys be physically present and organize meetings and staff and that kind of thing, then yeah, you'd probably be expected to be in studio. Uh, and I'll follow with the last question. Last one is <laughs> Ricardo asks, can we follow up with you in the future for any more questions? Um, you can always shoot me an email. Um, that's usually the best way for me to respond because I don't really respond to Instagram DMs. So uh, shoot me an email and I'll try and get back to you if I can. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, overall, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this was really awesome getting to meet you guys and also hear all of your questions. And I hope this has been helpful. So thank you so much again. Yay, thank you. This was so, so, so awesome. And this is a really big deal for, for our department. So it, it really means a lot. But um, and thanks for everyone for coming. But I'll move it back to our um, vice president who has some closing statements. And if you wanted to plug anything, like if some people here might not know, I'm sure it's all over all of the marketing material. But if you wanted to shoot your, your handles in the chat or website or what, whatever you want, um, feel free. And also this will be, this was recorded. So we'll have that on YouTube. Um, Can I just and, send, oops, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, so there's my timer. Perfect. Um, so yeah, if you want to take it away, Roshi, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for sharing your experience as an artist and animator. And thank you to everyone who made it um, to the Zoom meeting today. And thank you to everyone who made the event possible. We're going to be uploading the Zoom recording to the to our YouTube, which is Women in Animation ASU 4960, which I'll put in the chat in a bit by this Friday, the 20th. And we'll put the link in our Instagram link tree, which is at wea.asu. And we'll be sending it to our members via email as well. We really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. So awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks for coming. Um, let me know if there's anything else you need me for or if uh, if it's time for me to go. Uh, We're all good, I think. Yeah, okay. this is awesome. Great, awesome. This is so perfect. Okay. Yeah. I'm so glad you guys enjoyed it. And thank you so much again for having me. I hope you guys have a great evening. Wait, Bye. real quick, before we, before we go, I have one question. Where do we find your email? Oh, email address. Uh, here, let me type it in the chat. It is also, if you go to my Instagram or Twitter and like click on the link, I think it's also there. Like it should be uh, on my social media. But yeah, thank you. Helps. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>